afternoon, everyone. The time is 2 o'clock, and we want to start our training for today. Good afternoon. My name is Crystal Tosin. I am the Supervisory Staff Accountant in the Grants Financial Management Division under the Office of the Chief Financial Officer at the Office of Justice Program. Welcome today. So today, um, we're going to be um, going over the conference cost submission, approval, and reporting requirements. We'll try to give you plenty of examples. And just to let you know, we do have our subject matter experts on the on the training as well under OCFO. They are Angela Wade and Alicia Hallman. They will be able to answer your questions as I go along to, in today's chat. Just as a reminder, today's chat is open to all panelists. Please do not switch from that so that all the panelists will be able to see the questions and answer the questions. Those questions that are not captured will be sent out at a later time. We will capture all of the questions in the chat. We will then actually answer all the questions and everyone who is on today's call will receive the answers to all of the questions that were asked. So let's get ready for our training. All right, next slide. So today, um, we're going to be going over the conference policy, and we'll go over that in very great detail to help you along with your conference call submission. Next slide, please. Um, just to let you know that we are governed by the DOJ policy. Um, so when we're reviewing this conference um, policy, it's really just to make sure that we're um, being efficient, that we're eliminating unnecessary or wasteful spending. And we are governed by this particular policy for DOJ. Next slide. And so why are we actually reviewing the conference calls um, submission separately? I can just tell you that we're fundamentally responsible um, to be effective stewards of taxpayers' dollars of taxpayers' money. We want to ensure stewardship over federal funds, and it is our goal to make sure that our department's core missions are supported. Are you increasing public safety? Are you improving the fair administration of justice? That's the OJP's mission. And when we look at conference calls, submissions, we're looking at the justification to make sure that the conference is in line with our mission. Next slide. And so conferences can be broadly defined. And I wanna really just spend a second on this to just tell you because just because it's not called a conference does not necessarily mean that by definition under DOJ's policy that it is not a conference. You can call it a meeting, you can call it a retreat, a seminar, a symposium, symposium some, tra some training activities are considered conferences as well. In addition, like um, more recently, I heard someone say, we're not having a conference, we're having a convening. But you'll go, when we go over the next slides, I'll be able to tell you what a conference as defined by DOJ actually means. Next slide. So here are some characteristics of a conference, and this is not all, in, all inclusive, but here's some characteristics. Um, do you have designated participants or registration? Meaning that did someone, um, did you have a registration form that someone had to fill out online? Did someone fill out, um, send a registration link? Um, did you have to go online to fill out a registration form? Are there designated participants? Um, is there a published, uh, is there a published substantive agenda? Meaning, um, is it published? Is it published online somewhere? Can everyone sort of access it? You know, do they, everyone have access to this agenda? Um, is there scheduled speakers or a discussion panel? So these are some of the characteristics of a conference. And when you start thinking about those types of things, do we schedule the speakers to come? Is there a big panel that everyone can just kind of access this panel to ask questions? This, these, um, this can be a conference. Next slide. And so again, like I just said earlier, we're always ensuring that you're a good steward over federal funds. And so one of the things that we look at is, is just, are you being cost effective? Um, what's the best way to have the conference? I know you have to train some people sometimes and we have to have conferences, but what's the most cost effective way to have that conference? Can you have a webinar? Perhaps can you use a federal facility? 
um, sometimes that will not cost you any money. There's a list of federal facilities. Um, how can you minimize travel costs? Um, are you ensuring that the conference calls are necessary? Uh, is it meeting your business needs? Um, right now, and I can tell you that some people have hybrid conferences. Some people are meeting in person and some of the sessions are online or, or, or it's both. So you can come in person and those people who can't travel and maybe they're far away, then the conferences are streamed. And so there's hybrid conferences. But are you using the government's money effectively? We're always looking at that. What's the most cost effective option? Next slide. And so this is very standard. This is actually from our policy. This is from the DOJ financial guide as well. If you are a cooperative agreement or contractor, you must receive written prior approval before your event. Um, if you do not have the approval prior to you having the conference, then you must cancel your event. And we're going to go over the timeline as to when that, when we're looking for that conference call submission form. It's going to be very, very important because sometimes people will plan a conference and they have not submitted the prior approval in time and they've had to cancel the event. So the next slide, we'll kind of go over, you know, the timeline. So next slide. So this is very important. If your event is $100,000 or less, you must give us 90 calendar days to review that event. So you must submit it 90 calendar days prior to your event. Um, if it's over $100,000, we need 120 calendar days in order to review in order to review your event. So I'm going to spend a little second here because a lot of times um, we're sending a lot of conferences back right now because people are not meeting the deadline. They're not meeting this threshold. And when I say 90 days or 120 calendar days, that can be the date of your event. That can also be the date that you must sign the hotel contract. So let's just say, for instance, your conference is in May, but the, con but the hotel is saying that you must have that contract signed if you want to have that convention there in May or that conference there in May. It must be signed by March. So your 90 days really is not the start of the conference in May. Your 90 days should be submitted 90 days prior to your hotel venue contract needing to be signed. So it's in advance of the earliest, whatever the start date of the conference or the deadline to sign any of the contracts that you need. So a lot of times people will submit 90 days prior to and then they'll try to get us to rush it because now the hotel is saying, hey, we must have this contract signed by this deadline. So please pay attention and make sure that you know when your contract deadlines are because you need to get that submission before the deadline to sign that contract as well. Um, and just know, you if you know that you're having a conference, because you, you kind of know that prior when you're submitting the budget, you can actually submit it months in advance. Some people submit their conference um, submission six months in advance, eight months in advance. That's perfectly fine. You can submit it in advance. And so we encourage you to do so because we don't want your conference to be canceled. Next slide, please. All cooperative agreements, this is, this is um, according to the policy as well, all cooperative agreements and contracts recipients must, I say must, complete the sub and submit this conference, conference event submission form. Um, we will give you all the links. If you have not done it before, we will give you the links and all of the resources at the end, but it must go for prior approval. Each submission must contain all the applicable information, and we'll go over that um, step by step, and we'll go over every cost category in a second. Next slide. Okay, so do you need prior approval? So a lot of people get this kind of wrong. So a lot of people say, hey, my event is under $20,000, so therefore I do not need approval. That's not necessarily true. We have nine questions. They're in the DOJ financial guide. They're also on the conference call submission form. If you can answer yes to any one of the nine questions, that means that you need prior approval if you're a cooperative agreement or a contract. Is, it, is the cost of the event greater than $20,000? If it's, let's just say you answer no to that, are there meeting costs? Let's say you answer no to that. 
Are there any food or beverages? Most of the time, that's not permitted. We'll go over that in a second. But let's just say, is there a formal public agenda? Do you have a discussion panel? And you can answer yes to those. And let's just say your conference is $10,000 or even $5,000, but you can answer yes to any one of these questions that I will tell you that you are required to submit a conference call submission form. So don't be fooled by the $20,000. You have to go through each and every one of these questions. Again, they're in the DOJ financial guide, and they're also on um, they're also on the conference call submission form itself. So you start here, like, is it a yes to any of these questions? And then you can go from there. And if there are, I will just tell you, just for financial monitoring purposes, if it is a no for all of these questions, make sure you're documenting that and you're saving it somewhere. And so, you know, when they come out and they say, hey, you have a conference, you know, you didn't get prior approval. Well, you can say, look, I answered all of these questions. All of the questions were no. I filed this away. So just to just safeguard yourself. All right. Next slide. Okay. So, and, and we'll go over this in the next slide really in detail. Make sure that when you're submitting your conference call um, form, that you have really great justifications. And particularly on that very first one, we'll go over that in the next screen. But your justifications under in your narratives, make them as detailed as possible. Um, so we don't have to send it back to you. So to, we, we don't want to assume anything. So if, if something is very vague or if something is, is placed in the um, narrative section or the justification if it's very vague, most of the times we send it back, it just causes a lot of back and forth unnecessarily sometimes. So if you could just be as detailed as possible with your justifications, that would be so helpful and it would just kind of speed up your process. And make sure that all your supporting documents are embedded. Um, um, and sometimes justifications, it may take more than more than just the form. Sometimes you can put your just justification on a separate sheet. That's perfectly fine. All right, next slide. So here's a picture of the justification. So here's one that was actually submitted. Um, his names have been changed, but here's one that was actually submitted. So you'll see that on the left hand side, the before justification, it was just very vague. You know, we're just doing this research and that's why we want to have this conference. Well, I can tell you immediately that's going to get sent back. We want to make sure it's clear, it's concise, that the justifications meet the mission. Um, that is in line with our mission and our policies. And so the more information on your justification as to why you are having the conference, that will be better for, you, um, for us and for you as well so that we can approve it forward. Um, so you want to say things like, you know, this is, you know, you want to just make sure it's tied to our mission. Um, and so um, here's a perfect example, and I think you'll get a copy of the slides as well, but you'll see that it's very quantitative, it's very qualifiable, like they, they're basically telling us this is what this conference is for, this is how it's going to meet the mission. And so, yes. Next slide. Okay, so when, um, in, in recent years, since I've been here, they've come up with this thing called the Conference Concept Approval Form. And this approval form is for events over $50,000. If you're having an event and it's over $50,000, you must work with your program office in order to get this conference concept approval form signed. It must be signed by the Office of Eternal Gender, I mean, the, the OAEG's office. Um, and so this concept form, and I'll tell you what it's for, and I'll tell you how it sort of came about. So basically, when when we were having large events and we were approving them up all of the levels, and you'll see the levels in a minute of all the approval process that it must go through, um, by the time it reached the attorney, assistant attorney general's office, they were actually denying the, the conference. They were actually denying them. And they were denying them because you know, they, they weren't in an agreement with the mission, they weren't, they didn't have the, the correct purpose, they didn't have the justification. And so, and before the event now gets submitted, if it's 50,000 and over, we want the AAG's approval on it. And so that you won't go through the entire process and the event get canceled in the end because it did not line up to our mission. And so now the, the AAG wants to see the, the entire overall concept. What's the concept of your event? 
What is the purpose? What's the justification? And so now if there's an event that's over $50,000, that kind of get pre-screened, um, not all of the cost, but just the overall concept of the conference gets kind of pre-screened prior to us um, moving it forward. Um, prior to you even submitting the conference. And this just kind of eliminates a lot of back and forth or any, I mean, and, and it eliminates maybe your conference getting denied at the very end after it's gone through all levels of approval. Okay, so this, uh, this form again must be filled out by your program office. So you will work with your program office manager or your grant manager in, in order to fill this out and make sure it's filled out. You will just basically work with them and they will send it through the process. Okay, next slide. This is just the bottom of the conference form, and then you'll see that it must be signed off by an administrator from that particular program office, and it must be signed off by the principal deputy assistant attorney general, any event over $50,000. Next slide. So this is very important, and a lot of times, and we get this question a lot, um, we're submitting our budget, and so why do we now have to do something separate for the conference? And so I will just tell you, and this is also when your budget is submitted and your budget gets approved, there's, there's a couple of places. So under your special conditions, it basically tells you, although we have approved your budget, this is not approval of your conference. The conferences are separate. Um, and also, when our analysts and OCFO, when we send you a notice saying that, hey, your FCM or your financial clearance memo, that is um, once your budget is finalized and it's been approved by us, we will also send a notice just saying the review and approval of your budget and budget narrative, it just does not include the conference. And so, the conference still needs a separate prior approval. And so we do that in several places just to let you know, although we have approved your budget, the conference is now separate. We have to look at the conference cost separately. Okay, next slide. And next slide. Just to kind of give you a, a, a just a, just a brief timeline of kind of um, our process into um, how it is reviewed. It comes into our mailbox. It comes into um, the mailbox, and then the OCFO team reviews it. The program office reviews it, and that, uh, then if it's over a certain amount, it will come back to the to um, OCFO to go through another level of review. The OAG office actually reviews it. And then if it's over 250000 it actually has to go to our main justice department, which is called JMD, to actually review it as well. So the entire process, and this is why we, we want you to get it on time, because the entire process, if all things are great, this doesn't even account for it going back and forth to you if some things are vague and we don't understand some things. So this doesn't even account for that time, which is why we have this 90-day window. So just, let's just say everything is good, we, we're looking at about 30 days to get it through the review process. Next slide. Okay, so there is, I mean, so a lot of times people will submit and they'll say, hey, we want to expedite, expedite this review. There is no expedited review process. Um, and, 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 and the reason being is that we have so many conferences coming into our box. It's just not really, it's not really fair to the next person if someone has, um, has um, submitted their form on time and, and, and they're waiting for some contracts to be signed. We have to be fair and equitable to make sure that we review those grantees uh, conferences as they come in. So it's like a first come first serve basis, which is another reason we ask you to just please, please, please have it in on time. And it just really depends also on the complexity of the um, conference. Sometimes they're very complex. Um, there are many attendees. And so we're, I mean, just give us adequate enough time to actually review them. And because each one is so unique. All right. Next slide. So there are a couple of types of submissions and not everyone knows about them. So there's just a regular standard submission. You're having a conference, you just fill out the conference cost form. But we do have some other submissions. We have what's called a blanket request. 
And so this is um, if you're having the same conference in different locations within the same fiscal year. So let me explain this. So let's just say you're having the same conference. You're, you're training different attendees, but you're having the same type of conference or training every single month. Right, so you're having it in, in March, April, and May. Um, instead of submitting a conference form for each one of those trainings, because it's going to be the same, it's going to be similar, it's going to be the topic is the same, and maybe different speakers, and maybe the same speakers, but the, the overall concept of it is exactly the same. Um, instead of submitting three, you can submit one. And, and the great thing about just submitting one conference for all three of them is that um, you don't have to submit all three times or even four times. Some people have six of these things. And so it just eliminates a lot of the review process. And the great thing about when you're submitting a blanket request, you can actually um, take the highest amount. Let's just say you're having it in um, D.C. and California, but California is higher priced than D.C. When you do the blanket request, you would use the highest amount in each category to actually put there. So you'll just say the hotel in D.C. is $1,000, the hotel in, in California is $10,000. Um, it shouldn't be that much of a disparity, I'm, I must say, but I'm just, just for illustration purposes, let's just say 1000 and 10000 So on the blanket request, you would use the highest amount in that category because, I mean, if you're having the different places, we don't need all the amount in all the different places. We just need the highest amount in each single category. So it may be higher for AV in D.C. It may be higher for meeting space in California. So you'll take the D.C. highest for that category, the California highest for that category. So that's a blanket request. A combination request is really done by our conference team. If you know that you're going to be collaborating with another grantee to have one big conference, sometimes two, three, three grantees together have one huge conference, um, it is very important that you let us know right into our prior approval email box and say, hey, I'm submitting this conference, but I'm actually going to be in collaboration with two other grantees. That's important to know because what happens is we will then at the conference cost level, we will put all three conference call submissions together. To, um, and so and we will package it together because we want to know the entire cost of that one event, although it's coming from three separate grantees. But you have to let us know. So now we package it together and then we um, move it forward as one conference to for our um, team to then review. So it's very important if you're going to be collaborating with another grantee, let us know so we can then pack, we will wait actually for that other grantee to submit. Another thing, if you are going to collaborate with a grantee, I will tell you this. So a lot of times one of the grantees will have their conference at on time, but the other grantee will not. We cannot start the review process and your time is ticking. We can't start the review process until we get the entire package. So if you're going to be collaborating with a grantee, please let them know, hey, this is the day that we're going to be submitting this package because otherwise your, your package is not going to be reviewed. It's going to sit in the queue and wait and then you may miss your deadline. We've had that to happen. So make sure if you're going to be collaborating to also talk to that grantee. All right, next slide. Um, conference calls categories, here they are on the screen. I won't go over them in particular because we're going to go through each category um, next. And so just this is just all the conference categories um, that's on the submission form that you would actually go through. It's kind of similar to the budget detail worksheet that you work on on your budget, but um, some costs are kind of um, detailed out here. All right, so next slide. So conference meeting space, just to let you know, I just want to emphasize here that there is a threshold um, for your conference meeting space. Um, again, we try to tell you if you can, if you can, um, use a federal facility first because they, they will give you some free meeting spaces. And again, those are available online. Um, but if you certainly can use a non-federal facility um, if it is available, but just know that there is a threshold for $25,000 and $31.25 per attendee. And I know hotel rates are really, really skyrocketed these days. And we have we have um, actually um, increased the threshold, but um, just, just know that there's a threshold in this particular area. And this um, includes breakout rooms, you know, and uh, the entire conference, okay? Next slide. Um, cooperative agreement recipients, a federal procurement contract should compare three or more facilities. 
So you want to just kind of look at the facility. Again, we're looking at cost effectiveness. We're looking to make sure that, you know, we're ensuring um, that we're guarding our federal funds. And so make sure that they're, um, that you're looking at um, different facilities, just checking the different prices on different facilities. Um, let's see, even if there's a no cost site selected, we still want to know what that space is. Okay. Um, that's all I've got to mention on this side. Next slide. AV services. Also, this is a part of your threshold as well under meeting space, right? So this is combined. Your threshold for meeting room and AV combined, I know the AV is, is, is so high at these hotels. And so just be cognizant, just if you want to be at the hotel or at a, a space, um, sometimes they'll have AV contracts separately. Sometimes they'll be included in your space. Just make sure you know, hopefully that you can get it kind of all together, that space and the AV cost, like your mics and all of those things, just be cognizant that the AV cost and the meeting space cost, that threshold is together. And so make sure that, I mean, hopefully they'll include the monitors, the microphones, some flip charts and all those speaker systems. But um, if there is a separate contract for AV, um, then that should be also included in your package for your submission form as well. Okay, next slide. Printing and distribution. I mean, of course, you, you're going to have to make copies. You know, we understand that. We just ask that you kind of be just efficient in your printing and distribution. And when you're filling out your conference calls form, make sure that you're very detailed in, in what you're using the materials for. For every effort, if, if you can do it electronically, I would say, try to do it electronically. Use um, print-on-demand services. Um, printing materials should be maximized paper uses. Maybe you want to print on both sides. You know, that's cost-effective, right? right? If you don't have to have color copies, I mean, maybe cheaper to get black and white copies. But all those things, just consider um, when you're doing your printing and distribution. Um, there's so many different ways now with these QR codes that you can scan and, and you know, and the, and, the, and, the, and the program can come up like that. Materials can be distributed in that way. So whatever, I mean, however you do it, just be cost effective. Just always be mindful um, when you're using the um, printing and distribution. But certainly it is allowed. Um, we just we look for make sure that it's reasonable and really not excessive in this category. Next, in my, um, the lodging um, meals and incidentals, um, you can check the GSA.gov um, um, rate for those per diems. We actually follow that. We follow those rates that's in um, GSA. If taxes are included. Um, let's just, so let me talk about taxes real quick because this, this always poses an issue. Let's just say the GSA rate is um, $100 and, and you found a hotel and it was $100, but the taxes made it like $115. That's perfectly fine. So taxes um, and just let us know. So on your form, you'll just put hotel $115, $15 worth the taxes that were associated with it. Just let us know, just say the taxes were associated with, that's perfectly fine. We don't include taxes in the per diem rate. We know that there's some extra fees that's involved, but just let us know. Again, whenever you're writing those descriptions on the uh, on the conference call submission, just let us know so that we don't have to go back and ask. Because if we see that it's over, it's going to just delay your submission. We're going to come back and say, hey, this doesn't include taxes. So just let us know up front if you could. Um, if meals are provided, the meal must be deducted from the um, from your claim. So sometimes when you go to these hotels, sometimes you know meals are provided um, by the hotel, um, so you can deduct that from that GSA rate. So we're, I mean, if it's already being provided, you know, just make sure that you're not including um, that per diem rate on that day that you're actually eating, like breakfast at the hotel, for instance. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so this is very important. Um, so sometimes, because there's some wiggle room in some ways, but in this particular thing, so all contractors under an award funded by OJP awards for events that include 30 or more participants. So whenever there's 30 or more participants, must ensure that lodging costs for any number of attendees do not exceed the prevailing federal per diem rate for lodging. 
If the lodging rate is not the federal per diem rate or less, none of the lodging costs associated with the event are allowable costs to the award. What does that mean? It just means that if you have 30 or more people that um, are attending or that are traveling, um, you must, you cannot. There's no wiggle room in this. This is policy. This is written policy in the guide that you cannot go over the federal per diem rate. And the reason I say that is because sometimes when people are, I mean, it's less, you know, sometimes you can get some waivers and things like that. It's not recommended, but sometimes we do because sometimes there is no other way around it. But if you have 30 or more, there is no wiggle room. You have to stay within the federal per diem rate. I would say um, have the best negotiator when you're talking to these hotels. Let them know, hey, I'm, I'm doing a, um, I'm under government travel. Sometimes you can reach out to your program office. Maybe they can help you. I've seen them um, help you with a letter saying, you know, this conference is for federal government, under federal government, and sometimes they'll give you that rate. So have the best person on the phone with the hotel, that's what I would say, and, and really try to negotiate and contract those rates down, because sometimes they're really, really high, but you really want to have it there. So you may want to just, you know, talk to them and tell them that, you know, hey, just, uh, you know, whatever you have to say to kind of get those rates to make sure they stay under the federal per diem rate, and they understand that as well. Okay, next slide. Um, transportation, I, I, I would just say the thing about transportation is you just have to be very, very, very detailed at the transportation cost. A lot of times, and we'll, we'll send it back because um, sometimes, you know, um, we'll ask you, are baggage fees included? Just know that if you have baggage fees at the airport or the train, you can include those on your, on the submission. Um, anything that's in, uh, involved with your transportation or how you're getting there, make sure that you include those. Um, here are my baggage fees. Make sure that all of that is, is included under transportation. It could be airplane, it could be train, um, not including any local transportation costs paid by uh, DOJ funds. So total transportation costs to and from the conference location. Um, if there will be DOJ attendees traveling, um, just know that they, we have to try, uh, account for their travel as well. So you need to be reaching out to your program office and, and, the, and the program office would typically, um, the program office would typically fill in that part or give us the information about the, the, um, their, um, who's uh, traveling. Okay, so next slide. Right, so local transportation, again, airport parking fees, rental cars, mileage, any local tra transportation costs paid by the Department of Justice funds. That's what we want to see in your local transportation. Um, and just make sure that you're, you're just accounting for those and make sure that you're just detailing those out. So if you, if you want to have a rental car for three days and it costs $100 a day, let us know. This um, I'm putting $300 here because I'm going to have a roll call for three days and it's $100 a day. Again, just be detailed um, with us and so we don't have to kind of send it back and because and, we don't, again, we don't want to assume anything. So a lot of times it, it will go back because we don't want to assume what you're, what you're trying to convey to us. All right, next slide. Um, logistical planners. So this comes up a lot and, and just know logistical planners, uh, those um, anything um, logistically the, uh, to to hold the conference, and and I would just go over a couple of these logistical planning examples. Let's just say a logistical planner is it can be internal, it can be your internal staff, or it can be external. And and if your staff are um, making the arrangements logistically, make sure your staff's time is actually accounted for under logistical planners. So if they're doing some logistics for the conference, and some logistics include um, some flight arrangements, they make a hotel arrangement, putting up the registration page, uh, managing attendees on site, that happens a lot, updating the website, creating and sending marketing emails, creating registration, conference handouts, shipping the conference handouts, assisting speakers with the setup of the projectors, um, any sound or lighting and, and time management, or they're on site and they're troubleshooting the issues, they're making sure that the conference is running smoothly, logistically, kind of behind the scenes a lot of times. You know, they're making all of those arrangements. That is logistical planning. It could be done by your internal staff, again, in your organization, or you can hire contractors 
sometimes contractors will also um, do your logistical planning for you. This is that section only. Um, there is a threshold for logistical planners as well, 6250 per attendee, not to exceed $11,000. Um, logistical um, planners, uh, as well as programmatic planners as well, we'll get, go to that. The time must be broken out by hours. And this is all in our job aid. So make sure when you're filling out that conference call submission form, one of the tabs is a job aid. And we actually give that real example. Um, we give real life examples in that job aid as to how it should be broken down. So a logistical planner, let's just say um, you're accounting for 100 hours in a logistical planner field. So of that 100 hours, we want to know what they've been doing for 100 hours. So you would tell us, literally, you will write it out, 20 hours was um, we used to prepare um, registration forms. 20 hours we used to book flight arrangements and hotel arrangements. The other 20 hours, we want to know exactly the breakdown of, and the by task, because we want to make sure that all, all the tasks are in the right categories. And so be very specific and just make sure it's logistical in nature, okay? Make sure there's, I mean, all the things that I just mentioned, and again, on the job aid, inside that submission form, we give you some real life examples and all the ones that I actually just mentioned as well. Okay, next slide. Same thing with programmatic planning. And when you and so and, and so there's a lot of confusion a lot of times between logistical and programmatic planners. When you think about programmatic planners, think about it like this. Anyone who's developing the content. This person is developing the agenda. They're they're developing the materials that will be used for the conference. Let's just say that you're going to be training on, I don't know, cybersecurity, for instance. So they may be preparing all the documents for the cybersecurity documents to be handed out, all of the written material. They're making sure all the written material are good. They're developing this material. Um, and, they, and most of the times they're subject matter experts. They're the experts who who putting this material together. And so, um, but a lot of times we'll get, um, people will get them kind of confused. Again, it's in the job based some examples, but um, programmatic planners, a lot of times they, um, they secure the speakers a lot of times because they know what, what speakers are needed. Um, they communicate with the speakers. They develop this conference agenda. We went over that already. Um, a lot of times um, they do a lot of, let's see, uh, programmatic planning, they do a lot of uh, note taking. Um, because they're taking notes during the conference. They're, anything to do with the materials, you know. Um, make sure that even in um, logistical and programmatic, and we'll go over the facilitators as well, you know, um, you can actually put their prep time in there as well. If they're, if they're prepping, you know, for, for the event, so it's prep time, but just tell us what you're doing in that prep time. So, again, anything that you can do to be as detailed as possible, that would be um, great. $250 per attendee, not to exceed $43,750. Again, must be broken out by cash, just like the logistical planners, hour by hour. Let us know what they're doing. Is it internal staff? Is it external staff? Let us know hour by hour by hour. hour. And if it's an internal staff, I would just let you know. Also, inside of these categories, logistical planner, programmatic planner, so if they're going to be traveling, those hours spent traveling to and from the conference also can be in this category. So if it's a programmatic plan, or let's just say one of your staff members are developing the content and then they're also going to the training. So they want to put the, all of the, the hours they spent developing the, the um, material that's going to be in the plan and also their travel Time, the time, the hourly wage time that they're traveling back and forth to the conference, that can also be included as well under the programmatic planner. But just make sure that when you're accounting for your staff's travel time, that that time is, is included under whatever role or task that they're doing. So if they're, if they're um, performing some logistical planning and, they, and they're um, going to be flying out, you know, make sure their travel time, those hours that you're actually paying them to get to the conference, make sure that's in included under under that travel time, under that particular category, whichever role that they're they're doing. Okay. Next slide. Conference facilitator. 
So the conference facilitator is really the trainer, the moderator, the speaker, whoever's facilitating that, whoever, whoever the instructor is. Again, it can be internal staff, external staff. I will tell you that in an under conference facilitator, um, you can't include prep time. Let's just say the prep time, prep time um, specifically um, that they're editing a presentation. The, uh, the facilitator needs time to practice on their speech. And so it's just not the time that they're facilitating, but also the time that it takes for them to prepare to facilitate. Um, prior to this, I'm, I'm practicing the slides, I'm going over the slides. And so that time is actually my prep time. Um, and so make sure they're including prep time. And again, if they're gonna be going to and from the location, that travel time actually is also included under the conference facilitator if they're facilitating and traveling to an event. I mean, sometimes they could be on site, you know, but if they are traveling, you can also include their prep time as well. And again, that's prepare, preparing them to speak. Now, some confusion has come up recently that sometimes our facilitators also fall into the category of, of developing the material. That's perfectly fine. So if they fall into both categories, let's just say they fall into both categories, you could split the time. So let's just say 40 of the hours they spent developing the material, that's fine. Put that under programmatic. If they are facilitating and all the prep time that they need facilitating, put that under facilitation. If they're doing both, we just want to see it in both categories. Otherwise, we want to kind of send it back and say, okay, what is this person doing? Because a lot of times what happens is we're reading that line, that description, line by line. So if you say that this conference facilitator developed the program, developed all the materials, we're going to be looking for that cost to be in, programmat in programmatic. Or if they arrange some hotel flights for other people, we're going to be looking for that in logistical. So even if it's one person and they're doing three different tasks, make sure you're putting those hours under those specific tasks. Because if you put it under the conference facilitator and they're doing some developing of materials and they're doing some other things, we're going to send it back and say, please break down the task um, by hour under those specific specific defined roles. So that's very important because that comes up a lot. So I just want you all to understand that because we're really, really um, looking at those descriptive tasks. So if, if they fall into another category, make sure you're just putting that time into another category, okay? Next slide. So other costs, and, and so, you know, as an accountant, we hate other or miscellaneous, right? So if you say other costs, make sure you just break it down. It has to be itemized, because we just want to send it back. Say, what's the other cost? What does that mean? We don't know what that is. So other costs, I mean, just make sure you're just writing it down, be very descriptive, um, you know, as possible when it comes to other costs, and, um, and just let us know what they are. Um, that's the that's the biggest thing I can tell you on other costs. Um, so it's just, other costs is just any cost that does not fall into the other categories. But um, a lot of times, most things will fall in. But every now and then, there'll be something that just doesn't fall into one of the categories given, and and it's perfectly fine to put in the other costs. But just let us know what they are. All right. Next slide. Um, indirect costs. Oh, we get so many questions on indirect costs as a whole separate training by itself. But when it comes to conference costs, I can just tell you that the indirect cost rate in, um, must be a current agreement that that indirect cost negotiated rate, if you're going to be using indirect costs in the conference cost submission, it must be a current agreement and it must cover the portion of the conference. Let's just say your, your indirect cost agreement ended in June, but you're having a, a conference in July, you're not going to be able to use that indirect cost rate agreement or the indirect cost, uh, recover those costs in July because your indirect cost rate agreement ended in June. Okay, so you must have a current agreement uh, and it must extend and cover your conference period. It's very, very important. All right, next slide. Food and beverage, I can tell you that most of the time it is not, um, um, it shouldn't be any food and beverage, but in very, very, very rare instances, um, it is allowed, um, but like I said, very rare instances. On your agenda, um, we're look, we're going to be looking for food and beverage. So when it's lunchtime, we ask 
and sometimes we send it back to them. So make sure you do this lunch on your own, lunch on your own. It must be addressed in the agenda. Otherwise, we want to um, send the agenda back to you. So uh, the agenda, once you submit the conference calls package, the agenda is one of the items that you must submit. And so the first one of the first things that we do when we look at the agenda, as we're going over the agenda, we're making sure that you're not providing food and beverage. And we're also making sure that you actually are stating on the agenda just to kind of cover yourself as well, um, making sure that we're not spending money on food and beverage, okay? And so um, that, that has to be on your agenda. Um, make sure you put that. Complimentary food and beverages may be accepted if offered to everyone. Let's just say, again, I may I use the example of the hotel. Um, so sometimes hotels like um, Hampton Inn and Suites, Comfort Inn and Suites, I stay there all the time. Um, they have complimentary breakfast, perfectly fine. You can, you can have that. That's offered to everyone in the hotel. It's just not offered to you, but that's just a part of the hotel um, program. Absolutely, absolutely fine. If you do include food, it will kind of delay the process. It has to go through a separate process. Make sure you're talking to your program manager in those very rare instances before it even gets to us, because I can just tell you we'll send it back. Um, it has to be justified, it has to be approved. There's, there's a lot surrounding food and beverage. So um, just know that, you know, most of the times, 90% of 99% of the times, you would not be providing it and, and you just must state it, okay? Next slide. Um, if you have changes after the approval, um, just notify us. This is all I'm saying. Just if you, if let's just say we approved your event and you see that there's some, that something has happened and there's some substantial changes that's going on, just um, notify us and we just handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, sometimes, you know, we will say, okay, it's not a substantial change. So you can just report that on the post reporting. Um, if it's so substantial and, um, you know, we'll, we just handle that back um, case by case basis. Just let us know if you do know of any substantial changes after we've approved your conference, just kind of reach out to us and we'll, and we'll handle it from there. Next slide. Post reporting, next slide. So you are required, if you have any event, over $20,000 to post report. Um, all conferences for events held by a cooperative agreement, um, over 20,000 or more than 50% of the attendees, listen to this, or more than 50% of your attendees are DOJ employees, so either or. And let's just say it's 15,000, but 50% of the attendees were DOJ employees then you must post report 45 calendar days after the last day of the event. Your event ends on June 30th. You got 45 days after that to submit a post report. And that post report will include all of your actual expenses. Because you do know that when we're when you're submitting the conference calls form up front, it's really just an estimate, right? Your best guess, your best um, indication as to what the cost will be. Post reports, these are your actual things. What did you actually spend? And we want to make sure. So anything, and um, we're required to report anything over $20,000 of a conference. So make sure that you're getting those um, post reports um, in and timely. Um, you will get a notification if it is late. We, we try to notify, you know, it's 45 days after your event. We need your post report. Make sure you're submitting that to us. We do have the email site that you will submit that. That's actually on this resource page as well. It's also on, under OJP as well. Um, any variance that you have that's 10% and $1,000 or, but and, 10% and $1,000 um, greater than what you had anticipated it to be, then you must uh, explain the variances. Um, so you you just will explain to us, okay, uh, what happened here. And, and, and they're perfectly legitimate reasons. I mean, by the time, I mean, you submit your, um, you submit a rate prior to, nine, I mean, 90 days that, by the time you have your conference, things change all the time. We're, we're, I mean, it, it's not, um, it's, it's an estimate. And so we do understand that. But when it does go over, and it could be perfectly legitimate reasons, you know, things happen, just let us know. You know, you just explain that in your variance um, on your post report, perfectly fine. Next slide. Um, post event reports must contain actual costs. We already um, spoke about that. These costs should include um, 
any staff time spent on these activities, and we already spoke about that as well. Just these are just those um, reporting requirements. Make sure they're just your actual cost. Next slide. Um, next slide. So we do have um, just wanted to share with you some of the um, some of our top ten conference cost findings, reasons that we kind of return them a lot, and so um, just wanted to share those with you. Um, the first one is just that breakdown of those programmatic and logistical planning by hours by task. That's so important. I've already I've gone over that. I won't I don't I won't beat you up for that. But just make sure that you're very specific in those tasks that you're detailing them out that they're that they're properly categorized by the actual task. Um, make sure that you have that strong justification. We we talked about that earlier when we showed the picture of just a vague definition versus. This is what it's all about. This is this is how it support our mission. Make sure that's there, even if you have to have put it on a separate sheet, write a page about it. I don't know. Just make sure that it's it's, 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 it's concise and that it's clear that it meets our mission. That lunch agenda thing, I I already talked about that. Um, lunch on your own should be addressed on the agenda. Lunch on your own should be addressed in the agenda. Um, don't leave columns blank. You know, if it's, if it's something that you're not going to be using, like just say there's no no meeting room, um, there's no AV. So you're using a meeting room, but then there's no AV cost, right? So if the, if you're using a meeting room and they're not charging you for AV, please put NA under AV because we just send it back and just say, hey, again, we're not assuming. So if you have a meeting cost, we know you're going to need speakers and mics and those things. And so we want to send it back saying, are you making sure that you're capturing that? Um, AV cost, and so if you put NA, that means that you've already addressed that. So just, I mean, if you can, I mean, try not to just leave it blank. Otherwise, we won't have to send it back to just kind of get some clarification, because um, we just assume that if you're going to be meeting that you're going to have to have some AV cost, but that's not always the case. But just, again, just let us know. Just put NA on the form. Um, Attachments, again, um, make sure you have all of your supporting documents. Um, make sure you put them inside the emails and things like that. And all on the job aid and all of that, it tells you kind of how to do that. Um, do not upload revised versions of the conference call submission form. So this um, so this is um, basically, oh, so I got to tell you this. The conference call submission form, it gets updated sometimes. And sometimes the grantees may not get the notice before it gets updated, which is why we tell every grantee, and I'm telling you now, make sure that when you're getting the conference call submission form, that you're getting it from the DOJ financial guide because that will always have the latest one that we're using. So we try, and I know it's so much easier, and trust me, I do this, because this is an Excel spreadsheet. It's way easier just to copy the last conference that you had <laughs> and just put the new expenses in, much easier. I get that. But sometimes it happens, and um, and when we get the, the, the form, it's not on the right form. And so because everything is so um, calculative and everything, we have so many formulas in the background of that spreadsheet that the new form is not compatible with an old form. And so we have to send it back to you and say, hey, it's not on the current form. And so so just be mindful of that. I know it's so much easier to do that. I mean, I honestly know that it's much easier just to copy and paste and just change those numbers. but make sure you're using the current version of the form. And the current version is always in the DOJ financial guide. So we tell people, just go to the DOJ financial guide whenever you're submitting a conference call submission form. It will save you a lot of time and a lot of headache. It's a, it's a detailed form, and you don't want to have to redo that entire form because that's the headache in itself, right? So um, indirect cost rate, we already talked about that, must be caring for the period, detail breakdown in the printing category. Sometimes they just, they, they, nobody tells us what that is. They just say paper, or, you know, what's, what's the paper you're being used for? Is the paper being used for the conference? Are you just buying office supplies for your office? We don't know. Just let us know. Um, lodging rates um, always have the taxes in there. You know, again, um, we account for the taxes. We know that it's going to be a little over the federal per diem rate. Perfectly fine. Just let us know what they are. Put them. Make sure they're included in the cost of the conference. Transportation categories. Make sure, make sure you just put your baggage fees. This one bag. I could look to send it back and say, hey, do you have baggage fees? You know. So just make sure you just include it or no baggage fees. Here are the baggage fees. Or just make sure you're letting us know. That's that's I think that's the key here. Um, the more the better a lot of times, right? So we just don't want to assume. All right. Next slide. 
here's just a few reminders, and I think this may be kind of a repeat. Talking about our conference call um, approval form, make sure you reach out to your program office if you're going to have a conference $50,000 or more um, to get that form approved. I, I don't want you to submit it and it goes through the process and it get denied. And a lot of times, and so on the front end, if you do submit it, we'll kind of reach back out and say, hey, where's the conference uh, concept form? Because we don't want you to get all the way there. Um, we beat this one up, that strong and clear justification. Um, we, we say that over and over again, those separate pages, if you need them, make sure you're doing that. Um, all right, so next slide. Avoid delays. Um, sometimes these conferences can, can just get held up, and it, I mean it's not. I mean, and again, we we don't we don't mean to do it. We're trying to follow our policies. We're following our policies. We are making sure. I mean, we're the front line a lot of times. The OCFO office in terms of these expenses, and so um, help us. You know, help you as well. Um, do not alter the submission form. Some guarantees, I don't know how they even do it. Some of these forms are protected, but somehow we, we have geniuses at times, and, and they go in and they alter these forms, and they'll submit another form where our system knows, because our system will not accept the form. So make sure you're not altering those forms. Just fill out the information. Again, if additional spaces need to attach a sheet, um, do not leave those blank spaces. Again, because we're not assuming anything, you know, don't, don't, just don't leave the space blank. Just say NA, not applicable. You know, that's perfectly fine. Um, no current grant in place. So sometimes we receive some and you don't even have a current grant in place. And make sure that project is, and, and I'm saying that to say that your grant may have expired at the time that you want to have the conference and, and make sure that you're submitting that project period extension you know, or sometimes that project period extension had not been approved as of yet, right? So if you if the grant is after your current um, grant um, expiration date, that project period, um, that is that's unacceptable as well. Okay, so make sure you're doing that as well. All right, next slide. And here are some resources for you all. We have plenty of resources and we're working on them every single day just to make sure you all are updated. I, I can promise you that everything I spoke about today is actually embedded in some of the resources. The job aid is a great tool that we have so many different um, tools now that you can just um, get help, reach out to your program managers. And they will certainly get in contact with us and, and we're constantly answering questions. And so next slide. Um, so we do have um, different boxes. If you are a grantee and you're under BJA, BJA has their own specific box for the prior approval. So you will submit it to the BJA conference mailbox for all other bureaus, uh, Smart Office, NIJ, OJJDP. We have um, a, a, a larger email box for you that you can submit to. We do have a separate email box for those that are post reporting $20,000 or more. You will submit it to the post reporting email. And so next slide. And again, I've already mentioned that we have so many, um, so much guidance for you. And again, we are here for you. We want you to be successful in submitting your conference calls, which is why we are conducting these trainings now in OCFO. We're here to answer any of your questions. Again, hopefully you've been putting them in the chat um, and, our, and our subject matter experts are available to answer them. Um, we do have the DOJ Grant Financial Guide. That's what we use for all policies. We, we also are governed by the Federal Travel travel regulation, and I can just tell you, we have so much guidance on conferences. We have the conference event submission, all of the instructions. We have the job base. We have FAQs on how to submit these. We have the food and beverage policy that was recently added to the conference call um, site as well. And so you actually get a copy also, I believe, of this slide, and so you can just um, see all of the resources that we have available to you. And, um, and so I think at that moment, I think we have concluded, I believe, um, this training, and I hope, hopefully, um, we've answered some of your questions. We do have an evaluation survey. I won't convince you to say great things about me, but you know, <laughs> but we do have an evaluation survey. Um, make sure um, 
like the, here's the thing. So we have the read the scan the QR code here that's shown below. We'll leave it up for a little bit um, with your mobile device, and then we just ask that you um, fill out the survey. And again, hopefully we we've asked, answered some of your questions today, and it's just been such a pleasure um, with me explaining this um, um, to you all. And so I'll give you all a second um, to get the the QR code for the evaluation. Crystal, this is Crystal. Um, currently, all the questions have been answered in Q&A. Um, I can give like five more minutes to see if any other questions um, are going to come through. One just came through. Uh, it, it is, oh, oh, Sarah, that's about the survey. Okay. But I'll give um, a few more questions to see if anybody has any, a few more minutes to see if anybody has any questions um, regarding the conference call. Okay. Thank you. There's one question that came through. Is there, are there any exceptions to the consultant rate? So I don't know if Angie or Alicia wanna chime in. Hi, for the consultant rate, if the consultant rate is going to exceed $650 a day, you should work with your program office to um, request approval for the additional amount via a GAM. Okay, I'm going to give it about two more minutes and then, uh, Crystal, I'll let you know because then we can wrap up after that. Okay, Crystal, so no more questions have come in. Um, okay. Okay, thank you all so much for attending once again. Hopefully this was very helpful to you all. And again, if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Hopefully we've answered all of your questions in the chat. And thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>